good evening everyone so welcome to session 7 of current edge so we have been continuing with our weekly 25 questions and workbook related to this so today we are on 16th of october where we are doing the september 2023 related topics so far we have covered around this will be the seventh class so far so we have covered around 175 topics by next class we will be touching the 200 topics so that is our plan after september you have october november and by the end of the month december also we can cover on this mode after that in january we will be shifting to theme wise coverage of civil current affairs let's get started with today's business answer the first question go through the first question then we will try to solve it yeah i hope you have at least given attempt to solve the question let's go through the question once with reference to oiml or international organization for legal metrology it's oilm consider the following statement it was established in 1955 when headquartered in paris highly factual statement it develops modal regulations standards and related documents for the use by legal metrology authorities and industry so it is an international organization related to legal metrology so it will be mostly doing developing standards for inter-country commerce it will be developing global standards for different measurements different legal aspects related to this so this statement seemingly too much in line with the name of the organization so it should be correct so at least you can eliminate one option second option if we are taking it as correct come to third option india is an oiml certificate issuing authority so why we are discussing this topic why oilm is in news why oilm oilm is in news because recently india became the third 13th country 13 country to become a certificate issuing authority so what does it mean for legal equipment related <coughs> aspects for standards for measurements all these kind of related aspects india can issue its own authority earlier what happened there were 12 countries which can issue this certificates so if india need to export something to suppose say usa india need to export so before exporting india need to get the certification done from some other countries it's not that whole goods will be traveling to some other countries but india has to get this certificate issued from some other country so this now with issuing certificate india is also becoming an issuing certificate indian legal system indian regulatory system with regard to certificate related to metrology that will be in india it will be done by ministry of commerce of consumer affairs so ministry of consumer affairs or bis or any other organization that has been mandated can issue certificates related to this so this can promote trade this can ease the doing business across the countries this can improve india standards in exports so a lot of export promotion leader related benefits it is going to get now third statement is correct second statement is correct so one more option you can eliminate your answer should come one of these and if you exactly want to answer this you need to know this factual information india at least if you remember that india joined this organization in 1956 so it should be somewhere opened or somewhere open for signature before that 1955 it was formed and it is headquartered in the paris first option is also right option so here correct answer is all three are correct so this is the news india became 13th country to issue globally accepted oiml certificates for measuring instruments 
legal metrology division department of consumer affairs mean under ministry of consumer affairs will be the regulatory authority in india now about this organization it was established as i told before in 1955 headquartered in paris crucial international standard setting body develops standards and regulations for legal metrology impacting various instruments clinical thermometers petrol dispensing units etc etc india joined in 1956 oma certificate means single certificate accepted worldwide for instruments such as digital balances clinical thermometers etc so india authorized to issue this certificate right now different benefits include as i told export promotion there will be reduce on dependence of foreign countries there will be the cost of export the ease of doing business all this can be improved by getting access to issuing these certificates so this is one of the statement by the minister it is a single certificate accepted worldwide for example suppose there is an equipment manufacturer making digital balances in noida and he want to export it to america or any other country earlier he would be required to go to one of the 12 countries for certification now the certificates can be issued in india and the equipment can be exportable and accepted in the entire world so this is the crux of benefits associated with india being a certificate issuing authority let's go ahead answer the second question go through the second question then we will continue the discussion yeah i hope you have at least go through the question so let's uh, read the question once with reference to cotton that is considered as a source of all three f's what are the three f's food feed and fiber consider the following statements cotton seed is india's largest domestically produced vegetable oil you if at least if you have gone through the vegetable oil india's highest producing vegetable is palm oil soybean oil and mustard oil and cotton seed oil is not the highest grossing oil so first statement is actually correct incorrect like even cotton the major product is not the oil but the fiber so the focus here is on fiber so it is not considered as too much important for vegetable oil category the white fluffy fiber or the lint that is used for making fibers or cotton or all these kind of con elements constitutes more than 50% of kappas the raw and grind cotton harvested by farmers so if you take this kappas that will be it's mo mostly contained of seeds and other unusable items only less than like 30 to 40% of this kappa that is less than 50% is only the lint lint is the fiber which you can actually use for making clothes so again this second statement is both are wrong statements so here answer will be d will be the correct answer so what other logic you can apply here at least why we are discussing this because there has been reports that cotton why we are discussing this india's cotton production is declining due to devastating pink bollworm pest so the pest attack is becoming more and more severe in indian cottons and this is becoming a threat to most of our bt cotton that is being produced in india so despite promising new mating disruption technologies mating disruption technology again this can be a potential question wherever you see this note down in your workbook mating disruption technology this is a technologies that are developed to protect this bt cotton or genetically modified cotton from pest attacks despite this technology is showing promising results the overall impact has been minimal the overall impact is still resulting in decline in overall production of cotton so that's why we discussing this question itself now cotton it is a vital source of all of this 
only 36% of harvested cotton is lint there is fine fiber with rust being seeds having 62% and waste having 2% so cotton seed oil accounts for 13% of india's domestic vegetable oil production and it is second largest feed cake and meal source so this is not major highest or grossing oil vegetable oil production in india since 2002 we have used this bp cotton that is the only crop that is used in india as genetically modified crop we have discussed the genetically modified crop who gives the permission that is gm esc committee under ministry of environment forest and climate change so resistant to american bollworm boosted yields to since 2002 we have high yields from cotton but their effectiveness over the years is waning due to pink bollworm attacks cotton association of india estimates the output will be lowest in 15 years in this ongoing year so this where this is the general information related to cotton cultivation so what do you know in general about cotton cultivation india ranked first globally in cotton accrual sometime you can get questions on these also we have got a question on india's rank in rice production in one year so india ranks one in cotton accrual with over 12 million hectares under cultivation cotton growing areas in north we have this punjab haryana rajasthan area in central we have gujarat maharashtra and madhya pradesh in southern states like andhra pradesh karnataka telangana all these states are also growing cotton so this western and central southern part of the country is the major cotton growing areas it is mostly a karif crop but in southern states it is also grown as rabi crop why because of the change in winter pattern change in rainfall pattern in some of the southern state climatic requirements cotton cultivation requires warm growing season ample sunlight and moderate rainfall 500 to 800 mm followed by a dry period this followed by a dry period is quite important for cotton cultivation and timely rainfall sometimes highly disturbs the overall output of this cotton now temperature requirement is high temperature that is tropical temperatures of 21 to 30 degree celsius soil preference you already know black soil it is most preferred in black soil which has very good water holding capacity but it can it is not like it will only grow in black soil alluvial sandy loam clay soils or the soils can also it can also grow in these soils economic it provides livelihood to 6 million farmers export earning india is one of the highest cotton exporters throughout the world cotton seed oil is also a potential application cotton seed cake that is a feed for cattle that is a feed for livestock poultry this is also different products you can extract out of this cotton cultivation major challenge is pink bollworm pest attack so this is a map of cotton this is overall basic information related to cotton cultivation in india let's go ahead go through the third question then we will continue our discussion yeah let's read the question once with reference to banking in india consider the following statements qr code is contactless payment system that contains information about the item to which it is attached so easy statement you might have seen so much of qr codes this using this qr code you are paying to some bank accounts through upi so this qr code holds so much of back end information understand the sec first statement absolutely correct statement with interoperability of upi and central bank digital currency payments can be made using single qr digital code so this is an exact statement taken from newspapers at least if you have read recent newspapers what central bank or what different banks like pilot project has been first 
launched by IDFC, H SBI and other banks. Later it has been expanded by private banks including HDFC and other banks. So what these banks are offering is, we have already released the e-rupee. E-rupee what it is? The central bank digital currency. So that is a tokenized digital version of rupee note itself. You might have installed e-rupee transaction CBDC apps of different banks. So through these banks, these are issuing these rupees. That is digital rupee. Now, UPI is not a digital rupee. Through UPI, you connect your bank account and do transactions in this bank account. Now, this bank account transaction you do through QR code. Now, UPI is a different architecture. Our UPI and normal, this thing is another architecture. Recently, the central bank, that is the RBI, has came up with the notification you should merge these two or bring interoperability between these two. Now, with this interoperability provision, you don't need to have separate QR code for CBDC and separate QR code for UPI. This is not required. You can have a single QR code which can do both these functions. It can accept, it can do transaction either in tokenized currency that is e-rupee or through a normal bank, bank account that is through UPI. Both these can be executed through single QR code or a single framework. That has been, this interoperability has been initiated recently. That's why we are discussing this. So both these statements are correct here. Correct answer will be C. So UPI codes are now compatible with India Central Bank Digital Currency or eRupee app. This means users can pay eRupee by scanning any existing UPI QR code at merchant outlets. Interoperability, it means compatibility between different payment systems. All these are factual information on exactly what we have discussed so far. You can go through this. Let's go ahead, answer the fourth question, then we will go ahead. Yeah, let's go through the question. With reference to economy, consider the following statements. The cost of capital is a combination of cost of equity and cost of debt. So cost of capital. How you raise capital in a market? Either you issue shares. Shares you can issue to private entities or you can list in share market and issue to public. Here it can be to institutions, to all of these. So cost of shares, cost of issuing shares, all this impact cost of raising capital. That is other way of raising capital, that is through debt. Debt means you are taking loans from the market and you are paying interest. Here you will be paying dividend. So both of these obviously affects the cost of raising capital in an economy. Absolutely right statement. When yield goes up, the cost of capital goes down. So to answer this, you need some economic clarity on basic concept. What exactly happens when bond yields goes up? When bond yields goes up, lot of people go and invest in bond. That means bonds are giving higher returns. Bond yields goes up means bonds are giving higher returns. So what happened in the market? There will be a loss of opportunity capital in the market, which in other ways says that the cost for raising capital for private companies become more and more difficult. 
So if bo bond yields are going high, are you understanding? There is a private company, say there is Reliance as well as there is government bonds. Now if bond yields are increasing, that means returns from the bonds is increasing. So as an investor, if you are looking, bonds are much safer. So people will tend to invest more money in bonds. Why bond, bonds are safer? Because there is sovereign guarantee associated with these bonds. So people will invest more money in these bonds. On the other hand, when bond yields, suppose bond yield is 7%, 6%, for earlier it was 5%. Now it has gone up to 7%. Now what will happen for the private company? If somebody has to show interest in this private investor, when bond yields were 5%, it should offer only 5.5%. Now since bond yield has increased to 7%, now if, if to increase the whatever the capital or in, to increase the interest of the investor in this private company, it has to in, give higher returns. That is, it has to over a, offer a return of 7.5%. That is somewhere that is higher than the bond yields. So bond yields goes up. That means the cost for raising capital for the private sector equally goes up. So the second statement is incorrect. Here answer will be a one only is the correct statement. Why we are discussing this? Because the retail inflation in India has rose to 7.44% in July. That means it is one of the highest in last 1.5 years. So, these are different dynamics, different variables, how they perform with increasing inflation. What is the direct cost of inflation? That is decreased purchasing power with people. People have to give more rent, people have to give more for food and all this. So, people have less disposable income. Less disposable income. What it lead to? It lead to less consumption that lead to less demand overall it lead to fall in gdp so this is how it impacts gdp in the country secondly how it affects stock market typically high inflation lead to undervaluation of stocks as future earnings becomes less attractive when discounted at a higher rate so we already have high inflation so what happened to stock market? People will show less interest because they already have less money to invest. Even if there is high inflation, stock market are, if you invest 10,000 today in stock market, even if it become in two, two years or three years, it become 15,000. But the overall value of the money is falling. Then the overall return, even the 50% return you are getting, but if it is adjusted to inflation, that becomes too less. So people will show more and more less interest in stock market. What will lead to? Lead to fall in stock prices or undervalued stock prices, stock situation, undervaluation of stocks will be the situation that is resulting in. Gold as a safe haven. If currency is losing its trust among people or investors due to high inflation, people will look to other alternatives. Other alternatives like gold, like land, real estate, all these kind of things. So gold prices, there will be more investment coming into gold. There will be more demand to gold and gold prices will go up due to high inflation. It is considered as a hedge against inflation. Rising bond yields, this we already discussed. India's 10-year bond yield on 10 basis point increase, India's benchmark reaching 7.2% and all. So that's why answer the fifth question, then we will continue the discussion. So, with reference to open natural ecosystems, open natural ecosystems, consider the following statement. This includes open natural ecosystem are something that is in between forest and in between desert ecosystem. It includes savanna, woodland savanna, scrubland and grassland. 
two rocky crops ravines and dunes these are absolutely right statement so this is the definition of open natural ecosystems in india open natural ecosystem has been classified as wastelands absolutely correct statement environmental protection of 1986 protects against redirection of natural resources for the sake of development activities so here what when you are converting a forest for non forest application the act that is applicable here is not the environmental protection act but indian forest act earlier it was indian forest act 1980 right now it has been amended so which act will be applicable here is indian forest act or the amended indian forest act not the environmental protection act two statement first two statements are correct and third statement is incorrect why we are dis discussing a grassland restoration project in pune paves way for new approach for conservation of ones or open natural ecosystems so these are definitions around 10% of india's geographical areas is constituted by ones rest or factual information on renovation or the restoration project going on in pune go through this it is provided in your workbook also go through the six question then we continue the discussion consider the following statements deemed forest is a land that has not been notified as such by center or states when sanrakshan evam samvardhan abhiniyam accords protection as to notified as well as unnotified forest protection under forest act means land cannot be diverted without the consent of center as well as gram panchayats so what is the answer here why we are discussing this like yeah two statements are correct deemed forest is a forest land that has not been notified by such by center and forest this is exactly the definition of deemed forest one sanrakshan evam sam samvardhan abhiniyam or that is the new name for the forest act accords protection to notified as unnotified forest it is doesn't give port protection to unnotified forest only notified forest are been protect, protected under the act third statement protection under forest act means land cannot be diverted without the consent of center as well as gram panchayat exactly sta correct statement one and third statement is correct correct answer here will be b so why we are discussing because after the amendment to the forest act there has been some clashes there has been some issues in implementation of the act so the odisha government has a sent a letter regarding this sent a steps that has been little bit diverted from the provisions of the act that's why we are specifically discussing this rest all the facts what is deem forest what are the approval procedures all these are given in your workbook go through this